Ireland and the, the European platform is for two years now has been um, matching the culture of tomorrow. And I think um, historically, uh, you could say that there have been periods of pop culture where uh, imagining the music of tomorrow or the culture of uh, tomorrow has actually been the, cult the culture of the present. It's been the most contemporary thing going on. Uh, you know, and 90s rave culture would be a good example of that, where the people involved in it as creators and as fans were, were kind of like uh, tomorrow's people in a way, uh, to use the name of a science fiction TV show I used to watch when I was a boy in the 70s. They, they, they felt like they were already in tomorrow. It was just the rest of the population uh, was still living in the past. But I think to actually imagining, literally imagining the culture of the future, what culture will be like in 10, 20, 50, 100 years, um, it's actually very, very hard. Uh, you know, you can do, well, you can imagine it, but to imagine it and get it right, to actually predict it, I think um, may, may be in, uh, impossible. Um, you can imagine it, but what you will imagine is fairly unlikely to come about. And, and generally, if you look at the history of forecasting and prophecy, um, meaning not religious prophets, but you know, pundits, critics, futurologists like Alvin Toffler, science fiction writers, and others who have um, tried to uh, you know, draw up a picture of culture or society in the future, even the quite near future, their track record is actually not very impressive. Um, there's a story that, that's told about a famous jazz musician. I, I, I'm not sure who. I think maybe it was Max Roach or Charlie Parker. Anyway, he was asked by a journalist where he thought jazz was going next. And the musician snapped back, if I knew what the future of music was going to be, I'd be playing it already. And I think it's true in music that if something is, is thinkable in the present, then it is nearly always doable, uh, perhaps with a great deal of difficulty, but nonetheless, it's nearly always achievable. An example of this would be Musique Concrète, which you know, took a, a great deal of effort and painstaking difficulty to achieve, uh, you know, days and days of cutting up bits of tape and sticking them together. That later became, those sort of effects and results were much, much easier to achieve when the sampler and computer software was invented. Um, but that's an example of something that is, you know, if it's thinkable uh, uh, and doable in the present, then how can it actually be futuristic? It's not actually, um, it's not actually of the future, really. It's of the now. We might present it mentally or in our debates about it as futuristic, uh, but it's actually contemporary. Um, usually when we talk about something being futuristic, that means uh, one of uh, two things. The first one is that it's more, you know, more advanced than where the majority of popular taste or the majority of current artistic practice is at. Uh, and maybe we can assume that given time, you know, in a decade or so, more consumers and more creators will be embracing these innovations. So that idea of futuristic means simply the idea of the vanguard, uh, the early adopters. But sort of complicating that is the second meaning of uh, futuristic, which is that it corresponds to our quite well-established ideas of the future. And actually that generally means a set of cliches. So with sounds, that would be sort of electronic bleeps or inorganic textures, uh, sort of very intricate or uh, rhythms that would be too, uh, too too complex for a human being to play on drums, or just mechanistic kind of rhythms, you know, sort of incredibly precise and inflexible rhythms, uh, and then or it, or it's like visual imagery uh, that are also cliches. You know, the future will be clean, it will be sterile, it involves plastics of some kind. So basically, this sort of you know cliched idea of the future is that it will be less human, or at least less natural, less organic, more synthetic. Uh, 
And this is, you know, by now, this is actually a retro idea of the future. You know, I was really struck by this recently when I read about a new electronic group from the UK sort of vaguely coming out of the area of what they call post-dubstep. Um, and it's this group called the Silk Road Assassins. And they talked about how, you know, that we're really influenced by science fiction and science fiction movies and dark, you know, dark visions of the future. But their reference points, their reference points were Blade Runner, which came out in 1982, Alien, which came out in 1979, and William Gibson, whose cyberpunk classic Neuromancer was published in 1984. So these are like 30 to 37 year old references. It's a very uh, established and settled idea of the future. Uh, and I've often sometimes actually thought we might even need to come up with a, another word instead of futuristic. Uh, I, I thought maybe the word futuroid even would be good to describe the way that the, you know, the real f future will be what we don't expect and perhaps what we can't expect. Something that's beyond the limits of our current thinking, understanding or even uh, desiring. Um, generally speaking, I think predictions involving technology stand a, a better chance of being proved right because you can track where a certain trajectory of innovation is leading. You can, uh, you can also see what, um, what gaps exist uh, that could be full, filled in terms of what's possible. Things that people might want technology to do for them that uh, technology will you know, soon be able to achieve and supply for them. But even with this realm, with, with technology, uh, machinery and things like that, uh, if you were to go into junk shops and uh, the book sales of old library books that the library doesn't want anymore, um, all around the world, you'd probably find quite a lot of faded and forgotten paperbacks of futurology in which uh, the predictions are hopelessly off course from what actually happened. I remember getting one, you know, I was a big science fiction fan and a big fan of everything to do with the future. And I, I got one of these books when I was 16 in, in uh, 1979. And I wish I'd kept it because its ideas were just, you know, so hugely misplaced. One of the things it imagined was that by now, by, you know, by the, uh, the 21st century, there would be a huge revival of uh, lighter than air travel. So zeppelins and uh, dirigibles, uh, uh, balloons, basically, uh, carrying not just people, but cargo, you know, freight. And the skies, uh, there were so many of them, the skies would be full of um, sort of lines of these sort of floating uh, transport, you know, almost like uh, cars on an, an autobahn. Um, and that didn't happen, obviously, but, you know, it might be nice if it had, and, and probably for ecological conserving uh, fuel and resources, it might actually be a good idea to even try that again. Uh, or try it at all for the first time. And even if you can predict the future of innovations to come um, uh, and, and sort of imagine gadgets that will be invented, the cultural reception of that technology is far less predictable. As William Gibson famously put it, the street finds its own uses for things. The uses that people have made of, uh, of mobile telephones and personal computers, the internet, are generally not really what the inventors of those technology and the me media imagined. Uh, generally, they tended to imagine them being used in much more sort of lofty and improving and consequen cons consequential ways than we actually mostly use them, which, you know, rather a lot of the time is for trivial, self-indulgent things uh, or related to alleviating our boredom, our loneliness, you know, or our, our vanity or just for convenience, to make easier the kind of things we did before and always did, you know, shopping and traveling. Uh, it's not creating new desires or new behaviors, in other words. Um, as in a, a specific example within the history of music technology of uh, a cultural reception of a machine that was different than what was imagined by the people who made that machine. And that's the, um, the Roland 303 bass machine uh, whose uh, Japanese inventors believed that it would be used by uh, electric guitarists to create bass lines that they could then jam with. Uh, 
and it proved very quickly to be useless at that function and the machine was taken off the market but the surviving uh, machines that were still around in junk stores were picked up by producers in dance music and they were made to make sort of rippling psychedelic bass patterns uh, that are you know, familiar to anyone who has even a passing interest in dance music. And these, you know, these had no, no resemblance to what a bass guitarist would play. And they sounded completely alien and futuristic, such that the, the group that really pioneered the use of the Roland 303 with the track Acid Tracks called themselves Future, spelling it with a, a PH instead of a F to make it even more futuristic uh, and alien seeming. Um, so while machines and technology usually develop along fairly sort of logical seeming lines uh, such that you can sort of track them quite some way into the future uh, culture does not it seems to me does not have um, an internal uh, teleology driving it there isn't a sort of destiny that is unfolding within culture you know although often critics uh, and, and artists have liked to say there is and pretend there is and pretend that they are on the side of destiny and I've even done that within music you know talking about there's a trajectory that's unfolding and you you should all get on board this historical momentum uh, it's a ret but it's a rhetorical ploy I think it does it uh, it's it doesn't really have any meaning beyond almost being like a power game within the field of art you know it's people defining themselves into rival camps and you know trying to defeat other artistic practitioners or other critics often um, and, if, and if you look at the history of culture especially popular culture there isn't a logical predictable path to it it's full of swerves and, and surprises and twists and reversals and this often causes problems for people who, um, who write books about popular music because the author tends to assume, you know, tends to end the book kind of assuming that things will carry on as a linear extension of the present situation. Uh, one example out of many uh, is a book called All You Need Is Love, which is a history of 20th century uh, pop music by a guy called Tony Palmer. And it has a very expansive vision. It starts with English Music Hall of the early 20th century and early jazz and ragtime. It goes all the way up through rock and roll to the present era. The present, in the case of this book, being 1975. And the final chapter looks at what's ahead for pop music. And Palmer, you know, quite logically and understandably, thinks that because Mike Oldfield's Tubular Bells has just sold millions of copies and major labels are signing up similar sort of quasi-classical artists, you know, he thinks rock will continue in this direction. There'll be more and more instrumental, 20-minute long compositions. And the other thing he thinks is going to happen uh, is, but is, is that rock will become more like showbiz because Alice Cooper has, in 1975, has turned his sort of shock rock into a Broadway spectacular called Welcome to My Nightmare. It's choreographed, it has stage sets, it has props. It's a full-blown rock musical. However, by the time the book was published, it, it's early 1977, and punk has happened. And uh, Mike Oldfield, who was you know, voted, voted the best guitarist in the world by Melody Maker in 1975, he's still selling lots of records all through the late 70s, but he's completely irrelevant. There's nobody trying to be like uh, Mike Oldfield. Instead, it's all about punk and new wave, which is something that uh, Tony Palmer didn't ant anticipate. And similarly, the showbiz idea of rock's going to become more like showbiz. You know, punk is all about small clubs, and it's about the, re the removal of theatrics from rock. So there are many, you know, there are many other examples I could, I could bring up of pop critics who get it wrong in their, in their books uh, and their sort of predictions and prognoses. But to turn it on myself and, and my own books, um, you know, it's, just, it's the same syndrome. They, they, they tell uh, an accurate and, uh, if dare I say it, quite persuasive story about what's happened recently, right up to the point of finishing the book. But they often fail in, re in regards to the future. Uh, music immediately goes in a different direction. So one book I wrote called Energy Flash, uh, I wrote it in 1997. It came out in 
1998. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that r r techno and rave and electronic dance music would um, continue in its sort of onward march of, of uh, you know, defeating rock and, and establishing itself as, you know, the music of young people. And I also thought, you know, that ra rave music would just keep getting harder and faster and weirder and more futuristic. And in fact, actually, what the opposite happened. Dance music actually got slower for quite a long while uh, and it got more musical in conventional terms. You know, 130 beats per minute house music came back in a really huge way. Uh, and even worse, from my point of view, by the early 2000s, you had a kind of retro dance phenomenon. Uh, you had producers and DJs reaching back to earlier phases of dance music. Uh, and even before uh, techno, they are reaching back to sort of the pre-rave 1980s synth pop and electro. But even more sort of, you know, going against my, my vision of how things were going to go, rock made a huge comeback. You had the garage punk revival, you had White Stripes, Hives, Jet, you had groups like Strokes and Libertines. In Energy Fash, I quoted a DJ, a very famous DJ, and he boasted, I think it was 1996, he, he was boasting, he said, that turntables were outselling guitars. Every young kid wants to be a DJ. However, by 2003, guitars were selling more than turntables again, and every young kid, it seemed, wanted to be in a rock band. You know, rock, again, seemed cool and sexy, and dance music had actually become kind of uncool and boring. Um, so it's very hard to it's very hard to sort of predict how pop culture is going to go because it's driven by uh, you know there's fashion there's all kinds of unpredictable elements that cause popular taste to move and uh, another example of of, of me uh, or a personal example of how prediction is a hard thing to do um, is uh, Retromania, my book on um, retro culture, which came out in 2011. And um, certainly it was, you know, it was framed in, in, in the introduction I wrote and the, the, the promotion and the publicity, uh, interviews I did, articles I wrote around it. It was very much framed, framed as, a, as a warning. You know, it was like, it was, it was an, al an alarmist book. You know, there was a suggestion of a crisis, you know, and uh, a crisis that was getting worse. And, you know, I, and I used a f one of the sentences I wrote was something like, what happens when we run out of past? You know, the idea being, would we get re-revivals? Revivals are things that had already been revived once before, like mod or scar. Um, or what if it all, this acceleration of nostalgia just continues and we start getting nostalgic for things that happened only five years ago rather than, the usual gap, which is about 20 years, the, le the length of a generation. Uh, however, you know, by the time the book came out, I was already beginning to think um, it wasn't really about the future in those ca catastrophic terms, you know, which was like sort of the end of history, this sort of what I presented really as a kind of decadence, a kind of decadence of perpetual retro, perpetual recycling. Really, the book was a history, and it was a it was a history of uh, a pop history of the first decade of the twenty first century, uh, the two thousands or the noughties, as some people used to call them. Um, and I, and as that on that level, it was you know an accurate description of what it felt like to live through a time when time seemed to have stopped. And I was describing and analysing a convergence. I was using retromania, this term that had been around for a while. Uh, uh, used, you know, sometimes as the name of a store selling vintage clothes or something like that. I was using it as a gem not as really as a as a single c condition, but as a convergence of phenomena and syndromes, um, an umbrella term for for a, a bunch of things. You know, from broadband internet leading to file sharing, YouTube, and this sort of huge online archive of old pop culture. The, the reissue boom that just got bigger and bigger. You had format nostalgia with vinyl and cassettes. You had um, the growth of rock museums. You had more and more reunions of bands, festivals that were whose lineup was catering to demographics that were middle-aged people, nostalgic people, uh, such that you know the demand 
existed for bands like the Pixies to reform. Uh, a band like Sonic Youth are all about innovating. They just couldn't resist this demand, this consumer demand for whole album performances. Uh, so they would do Daydream Nation as a whole album. There's that, that huge trend uh, for bands to play their most classic loved album all the way through from track one to track 12. And you had vintage aesthetics in music, but you also had them in outside music, in design, and all over the, all over the place. So really, uh, you know, I'd written a history uh, about the dominant cultural aesthetic of the first 10 years of the new millennium. The sensation of time slowing down. Uh, and there was, you know, I f there was overwhelming evidence to support this, I felt, in, in fashion, design, music, s it, to some degree in other art forms that pastiche and mashups uh, and a sort of curatorial approach to culture an archaeological approach to the late 20th century uh, pop history uh, which was being sort of dug up and recombined you know there was a sort of sense of ghosts everywhere cultural ghosts uh, hauntology was a term that you know was uh, was being used as a cultural term to describe what was going on in, in music um, uh, I did wonder when I, as I was finishing the book, you know, okay, I've, I've captured, I felt pretty pleased I'd captured, you know, recent history as it seemed to me and, and quite a few other people. But I wondered how long it would be before it no longer described the current situation. And I was actually kind of hurrying to finish it and get it out because, you know, God, what if something innovative happened? I'd absolutely be fucked. Uh, you know, this is what I wanted to happen as a fan, a critic. It was my deepest desire but it would mean this book I'd embarked on and I was contracted to finish it would be rendered irrelevant. <laughs> so luckily I, I got it out in time in 2011. And I think it has continued to describe a lot of what has happened in pop culture in the years that followed uh, its publication. That year you had Adele with Rolling in the Deep. You had Lana Del Rey. Uh, a few years after that you had Daft Punk with uh, Random Ac Access Memory. Uh, I could have written a whole chapter just on that one record in Retromania, um, the career of Bruno Mars and the, the uptown funk hit, which was, you know, is pure retro funk and the outside music. There's been things like movies like The Artist and Super 8. Um, there's a kind of a 90s revival going on at the moment. Uh, and you have the vinyl revival that keeps getting bigger. It's going against the trend of history. And now they have vinyl records on sale in supermarkets and uh, high-end food stores in America like Whole Foods. Uh, it's a format that's growing popular seemingly with, with young people, with actual teenagers. Uh, although to me it seems more a gestural thing than to do with, you know, the, the supposed warm quality of vinyl sound. Because uh, research has shown what I kind of suspected, which is that in practice the vinyl purchasers tend to use the download codes provided with the record and they listen to the mu music digitally more than they actually play the vinyl. It's more a kind of weird cultural act to buy vinyl and, and, uh, and have it on display in your house. Um, so I would, say, I would say retro has remained prominent in pop culture, but I don't think it's dominant in 2016. Uh, there's this sort of odd coexistence of retro with practices that are very contemporary and digital and uh, in the, almost in that cliched sense, futuristic. Um, and if anything, in, in, especially in music in, in, and in left field music, there's been a kind of revival of a rhetoric of the future. It's come, the future is, is back in fashion. Um, and, you know, for instance, you have, uh, I mean, there's so many examples, but a, a prominent one is, uh, who's got a lot of attention critically, is the experimental electronic artist Holly Herndon. And her whole thing is about creating new sounds and the themes behind her work are, are very, they're both future-minded and they're optimistic, which is, which is quite unusual because usually with futurism it, it, in recent years, it's tended to be dystopian, uh, you know, about a cold, dark, chaotic future, as with that group, the Silk Road Assassins that I mentioned before. Herndon is very sort of positive and about solutions and 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 it's almost like policy, you know. Uh, and she talks about her, an interest that she has in what she calls science fiction politics. 
And generally, uh, there's been a pronounced drift across the musical landscape um, from online underground sounds like Vaporwave through to EDM in America to modern R&B and rap producers like DJ Mustard, uh, Drake, Drake's producer, uh, 40 um, artists, you know, R&B artists like Chris Brown, The Weeknd, um, hipster electronic artists like Rusty and Hudson Mohawk. There's been quite a strong drive away from vintage aesthetics. So rather than this sort of shabby chic sound of faded, fake analog, hipstermatic sounds is how I think of it, it's been a drift back to sort of, um, or a, dr a drift towards a sort of bright, busy, glossy, fizzy sort of sound that I, um, I call uh, digital, digital maximalism. A completely sort of denatured and inorganic aesthetic. So pretty much how, how people did always imagine the 21st century would sound. One, um, one aspect of this is, is the prevalence of uh, what people call, um, some people call vocal science, techniques for processing and editing and uh, almost colorizing the human voice. These have been part of electronic dance music for a while, but they really have like, spread all across pop music and, and all kinds of underground music not just uh, the d dance kind. And um, often they involve the deliberate misuse of devices and programs, uh, you know, designed for correcting pitch of singing or of an in instrument. Machines like the, the Auto-Tune auto and, and Melodyne. Uh, sometimes you can, you c these can be used to create uh, a distortion effect um, one of my favorite artists who actually is called Future, that's his name, uh, a, this great rapper in America, um, he uses auto-tune in this way to actually create a sort of digital, a digital grit, a uh, sort of dirt. I, I think of him as almost like a black Iggy Pop, you know. He's singing this kind of uh, post-human sound of pain. Um, but... Uh, Generally speaking, the, the use of uh, auto, you know, auto tune uh, and similar kind of effects is is for a kind of post human perfection, you know, uh, and you hear that all across the radio landscape. Uh, and I think, in fact, it's one thing that in the actual future we will look back and think, oh, that that's the sa that's the sound, that's the signature of the two thousand and tens. That's this sort of processed voice aesthetic, this perfected hyper real vocal sound. Um, you know, a voice that has kind of had cosmetic surgery done to it, a, a Botox voice, a, a voice that's had a chemical peel. Um, and um, I think that, that that kind of voice and this sort of general glistening, shiny, fizzy sound of, of sound production today, it's, you know, it's closely linked to the, the aesthetics of TV and film, P post-production procedures like, um, like grading, which is sort of uh, changing the color palette of things after the event, uh, after it's already been filmed. Um, motion retouching, which is a sort of digital cosmetic surgery applied to faces and bodies um, in post-production. It generally creates this sort of this gloss that's you know, perfect for high definition, big screen televisions. A few years ago, there was quite a bit of talk on the internet about what people call the new aesthetic. It kind of petered out now, but uh, there was a big buzz around it. Uh, people talking about digital effects and graphics and, and things that seemed like they were uniquely contemporary. Uh, as I say, the, you know, the conversation kind of died down. It was never quite articulated. Uh, no one wrote a manifesto of, of the new aesthetic. But one of the things that people talked about as their motive for wanting this new aesthetic was their boredom and their frustration with retro aesthetics, the aesthetics of the distressed, the worn, the faded, the analog, you know, or using like bygone old fashioned typography. Things like, you know, there's a big trend, I don't know if you have it here, but in the UK and in America for blackboards in restaurants with uh, things written in chalk, uh, you'll get that a lot in, in sort of trendy beer bars as well. 
young men with, with sort of Victorian or Edwardian moustaches. Uh, there was a big cult for a while of, of the manual typewriter. And amongst the new aesthetic people, uh, these designers, um, there was just a feeling of like total fatigue and weariness with, with these trends. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that futurism and the futuristic have, have come back uh, in fashion. Uh, an, an, another sort of thing that, f that feeds into this, I think, is actually a kind of uh, resurgence in the cultural sphere of the idea of outer space. One of the things I, I talked about um, in Retromania was the idea of nostalgia for the future, the idea of a lost future, uh, which could, it could involve all kinds of things, uh, nostalgia for early electronic music, nostalgia for modernist architecture, the, the brutalist movement that was particularly big in, in Britain in the 60s and 70s. Um, and, and a part of that was you know, nostalgia for the space race. And I talked about in Retromania about how in mainstream popular culture, the idea of space travel uh, seemed to have lost its romance. I, you know, I didn't get the feeling that young people uh, had any real interest in it. Uh, there didn't seem to be many, you know, hardly any movies being made about set in space. What was much bigger uh, amongst young people was this love of um, a certain genre of fantasy or, or that was kind of quasi-historical. It was set in a sort of never-never world that was like a kind of postmodern mix of elements from real Earth history, ancient history, but with things like magic and dwarves and dragons thrown in. Uh, and, you know, it's obviously Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, that whole genre. And this disappearance, almost complete disappearance of movies set in outer space, seemed to be connected to the declining public profile of NASA, uh, which just seemed to be almost inactive, or at least it was doing very kind of unglamorous, basically, you know, unimpressive work, like the space shuttle. The US government kept reducing the funding. Um, and... Uh, not long after Retromania came out, the space shuttle program was actually wound down and the shuttle was taken on a farewell tour of America and then it was placed in a museum. Uh, uh, you know, so much for the future. The future's now an exhibit in the Smithsonian. And um, that just seemed to fit this, this whole idea of, you know, the, the, lost, the nostalgia for the lost future, retro-modernism, uh, the idea of, of, of a museum of the future. Uh, and it seemed like, you know, that the, we'd all had to sort of abandon these dreams that many teenagers of my age at least had, had when we were teenagers was, you know, one day I'll, I'll go on vacation to the moon. Um, and there was the sort of, um, you know, musical expression of this idea, of nostalgia for outer space um, on the Daft Punk record, Random Access Memories, Contact final song, which has a sample of a voice from a, a, a NASA transmission, the Apollo 17 mission uh, from 1972. And the voice is from Eugene Cernan, who was the last astronaut to stand on the moon's surface. And um, the, the sample ends with him saying, there's something out there, because he's seeing a strange light in the distance. Uh, that's rotating. Uh, so there's something out there. So to me, that you know, that obviously evoked the the the, ro the lost romance of the space race. The, this sort of mystical sense. There's something out there. Our destiny is, as a species, is to go out there. Um, but the funny thing is that this was really you might say this song "Contact" by Daft Punk and random excess memories, this might just have been the last spasm of the whole retro mania era. Because around that time, you started to get a resurgence of films set in space. Gravity, The Martian, Interstellar. There's many new movies set in space coming from Hollywood this year. Uh, there's one called The Space Between Us, about the first human to be born on Mars. I have no idea if this reflect, actually reflects a, a sort of re renewed popular interest in space exploration, 
but it's certainly uh, intriguing. And even NASA, NASA seems to be either very busy or it's got a, a new uh, public relations department because every week it seems there's some report from the Mars rover or there's some story they've planted in the newspapers about a discovery or an, an initiative they've started, you know, that maybe they've got some new information about the moon, one of the moons of Saturn, that there might be life in the warm water that's sort of deep beneath the, the frozen ice crust of that moon. Um, and yeah, and, and it's not just NASA, our nations from China to India to even Brazil are taking an interest in outer space. Missions are planned. So space seems to have become a going concern again. You know, the lost future has been found. Um, so I mentioned, uh, so that's, an, uh, you know, that's another example of uh, the unpredictability of, of culture and how things can suddenly come back into fashion. And uh, in fact, if, if you've identified a trend, it's almost certain that that trend will, you know, will, will then be reacted against or reversed in some way. Um, I mentioned being a teenager in the, uh, in the 1970s and, uh, and I really thought, you know, by the age I am now, that there'd be a colony on the moon or hotels and if not me, at least some people would be going there as tourists. Um, uh, I, was a, I was a big fan of um, science fiction but not the kind that involves uh, alien civilizations, you know, thousands of light years away, or humanity thousands of years in the future. I had very little interest in wars in space between intergalactic empires. My interest was mostly in the, in the near future, what I might see in my own lifetime, or maybe a few centuries for now. So it's basically science fiction that involves um, the historical method, so, but sort of flipped forwards in time, an extrapolation of existing trends. Uh, but you don't need, you know, you don't, as a science fiction fan, you don't, it's not long before you realise, if you're, if you're reading these books and reading the criticism about these books that science fiction writers like to, you know, discuss their, what they're trying to do a lot. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the basic ideas you, you, get, you learn is that this method really tells you far more about the present than any actual future. And often it's a satire or a critique of the present. It's like a cautionary forward production. So one example of that, one of my favorite science fiction novels is a book called The Space Merchants from 1952, it's set in the near future, more or less our time. And uh, this 21st century is dominated by giant advertising agencies. and. Uh, Everything, the whole society is completely bent to the will of corporate capitalism. All the resources of the world have been used up because of overpopulation and hyperconsumption. So that actually, uh, that is not a bad prediction of what may be in store for us. But really, it's mostly about the 1950s, you know, the rise of consumerism. There was also a new, a totally new interest in advertising at that time. Uh, there were books like Vance Packard did a book in 1956 called The Hidden Persuaders. A sort of sinister glamour was beginning to gather around Madison Avenue. And, and in fact, this was the era shortly before the period that the TV series Mad Men dramatizes. And in fact, um, the authors of The Space Merchants, uh, Frederick Pohl and C.M. Cornbluff, were members of a, a left-wing science fiction uh, group in New York called The Futurians. And some of them were communists. So this, you know, this novel uh, is, is actually an anti-capitalist satire and commentary about the 50s. And in it, there's a, um, a, a, green, a green guerrilla underground called the Consies, short for conservationists. Uh, but it sounds you know, very close to commies. And so the satire is also of America's uh, hysteria uh, of uh, anti-communism at that time and the, the reds under the beds. Uh, Joe McCarthy and that kind of uh, persecution of communists. So um, the science fiction method, you know, I think its primary use really is to enable you to see the present more clearly and also in a more critical light by using this sort of projection forward. So I thought I would, I would try and uh, to wind up, I would... Uh, 
I would try and apply that science fiction method to popular culture and see if I could try and imagine a future, a future that actually tells us more about um, uh, the present. Um, I suppose the first thing that seems like obvious that's going to go on and continue is that I think music will continue to decline in, centra in centrality in popular culture. I feel like music has been demoted and I don't think, I really don't think it'll be the centre of youth culture or popular culture again. It's for a long time now, it's been fighting for space in the attention economy uh, and losing really. It's been jostling with games and com computer and internet, and social media and type stuff, fashion and even food I think. Uh, uh, perhaps this is, is maybe more uh, a phenomenon in America but I think in Europe everyone's always been interested in food but certainly when I was young if you were a bo bohemian or countercultural you never had any interest in food it was not something you would invest your identity in uh, but now young people in America uh, are obsessed with coffee and types of sake and uh, every you know where, where to eat you know it's almost like as, as the cliche goes food has become the new rock and roll uh, but uh, when I grew up, you know, rock, you know, I knew rock and roll people who were just almost indifferent to the idea of eating itself. Um, and so, but uh, yeah, I think music has a lot of competition uh, and it'll continue to have more and more competition, things that seem more exciting. Uh, I look at my own son who's 16 and he likes music, but he, it's very low on his list of priorities. He, you know, he would, he uses it, he uses it to soundtrack the videos he makes for YouTube, I don't think he'd ever spend money on music, and I don't think it'll ever be part of his primary identity formation in the way it was for me. Um, and another thing I can predict uh, fairly confidently is that with the decline of the centrality of of music, it's slipping down uh, in the hierarchy of leisure activities. Uh, I can also envisage very easily <laughs> uh, the decline of my own profession. Uh, I, mean, I think there'll still be people professionally and semi-professionally and on an amateur level talking about music and taking it seriously. But increasingly, uh, the, the, the idea of the critic who, the music critic, who sort of reads the times through music or takes the measure of the zeitgeist through music, I think that's less and less tenable because less music is, is consequential enough to sustain that kind of approach. Um, and uh, I think much more music, you know, it, instead of a, a sort of m mass public or monoculture for music, there's a series of micro publics, which, uh, each of which has a sort of minority significance. And also music generally just becomes more like something that's useful. Uh, you know, uh, some, something you soundtrack your life to and it, you fit it in with other activities. And one symptom of that, uh, I think, in a weird way, is that whenever there's a death of a figure now, like a David Bowie or Prince, who are these sort of titanic figures who are products of the monoculture, and, but they sig sort of signified as mavericks within the, the mainstream, you know, the mass context, they were working both in and against the mainstream. Whenever that happens, you get critics and fans who grew up with that kind of music, including myself, and we descend like, like vultures on the corpse, you know, because there's food for thought there. You can write think pieces and testimonials about how this transformative figure personally transformed you and changed society and everything. And I think there's less and less artists, fewer and fewer artists, contemporary artists, who could be written like that, about in that way, like... Um, like a Bowie or a Prince, you know, maybe Beyonce is that one of the only ones. Um, and increasingly, uh, she seems to be deliberately, you know, she started out basically pretty much a showbiz entertainer. She was a singer and a dancer doing sexy love songs in the main. But increasingly, she seems to be going more and more for this sort of, this shrinking market for to be taken as a zeitgeist figure, you know, like uh, uh, almost deliberately angling her work to be read and interpreted 
and analysed and annotated in an academic style. Um, and uh, the analogy I would use is that the monoculture, the monoculture that produced your Bob Dylans, your Rolling Stones, your, your Princes, your Bowies, all these people, the rock monoculture uh, or pop monoculture, I think of it as being like a white, uh, a white dwarf star, uh, this sort of shrunken, shriveled remnant that is super hot. It's giving off this intense heat, but it's the heat of a final gasp of energy. Um, and, uh, you know, so you get this the heat and the light blasting off these spectacular pop events like Beyonce and her visual album, Lemonade, or Lady Gaga a few years ago. And critics and reporters gather around it, uh, and uh, to quote uh, the American critic Nitsa Abebe, they gather around it in huge fawning riots to trade politicized takes on it. Millions of people standing in a circle, pointing and shouting and writing about it, conducting one gigantic online undergraduate seminar about it, which I think is a great description, but I, I really doubt if it's actually millions of people. I think that what it is, is the surviving members of um, uh, a, pund a punditocracy, uh, like a, you know, a class of people who make their name and their living through analysing pop culture. And then there's probably a minority of really heavily invested amateurs you know, who blog about it and stuff. But I've noticed in LA, where, where I live, you do not hear Beyonce on the radio. Uh, you don't, you know, her last album, you hardly ever heard a track from it on the hip-hop. And R&B stations, and I suspect the same thing is going to happen with this new album, Lemonade. So I don't think most people want that for music anymore. They don't want messages. They don't want to be to, to have their lives explained by music. They don't want to feel like they're being educated by music. Music is is to be used in your life. It's for dancing, having sex, background sounds when you're having dinner. Um, I think it's a different time now. And the idea of musicians making these great statements that have a sort of political resonance uh, feels like a, a throwback. It really does feel retro to me. Um, so, and for, for that reason, I actually think one prediction I will make is that, you know, you would think after Lemonade, after this visual album and all the discussion of it, you think, oh yes, visual albums, that's the way of the future. Beyonce is showing the way forward. Uh, I doubt that, uh, simply because there's hardly any superstars left who, who would have the power and the financial resources to spend that much time and energy and labour in terms of the personnel involved on such a, a product, you know, really integrated, high production values, audio, video, video album. If you, if you, I don't know if you've, who's seen Lemonade, but if you look at it, the credits involve something like 500 people, huge numbers of people in costume design, hairstyling, set design, uh, cinematography, lighting, editing, production. Uh, the production of the album involved no less than eight medics, eight people just looking after the health and safety of the people we can record. I mean, no band can, you know, who, who can do that? I mean, there's maybe Taylor Swift perhaps could, could do something on that stage if she wanted to. Because to spend that much money and time on something, it has to be a pre-sold concept. It has to be a, you know, a superstar doing it. Uh, and I, again, I just don't believe that people really, I don't think there are enough people who want that. It's such a lot of work to, you know, it's not something you, you know, you, you can't really put it on in the background. You have to sort of submit to it and sit there and watch it. And as impressive as it is, you know, uh, as a, an integrated, an aesthetically sort of sumptuous experience. It's not a useful record, a visual album. It's it's it isn't. It's sort of somewhere between an, an album and a uh, a movie. Um, and so I think what what it actually will be like is a bit like what happened with Sgt. Pepper in the '60s, um, where a lot of concept albums were made after it, but very few of them are remembered or regarded. I mean. Who now listens to Ogden's Nut Gone Flake by The Small Faces? Actually, one of the better concept albums. But, you know, it's hard. You got to number one in England, but it's not a well-known record at all. Um, it's much easier to make a bad concept record than a good one. And I think it would be the same with the visual album. Uh, I think people will go back. You know, people went back. Most people 
after the after Sergeant Pepper's and this sort of phase of, you know, dozens, maybe a hundred concert albums that came out, Mo the Moody Blues or whatever, uh, most people went back to making albums that just had songs on and that people could integrate into their lives and you didn't have to sit there, you know, uh, paying attention to it as a supposedly unified experience. Um, and I think, you know, probably the, it'll be the same with the visual album. There'll be this one landmark record, Le Lemonade, and maybe, uh, maybe a couple of others almost as good. But I don't think it's going to, it's, go it's not going to change the way people are using music, which is less and less to, uh, to uh, read the times with. Um, I've already talked talk quite a while. I had a, a long, uh, quite an extensive prediction of the future that was fantasy, but I think I'm going to have to leave that. I think we should go to the discussion bit. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, you All want. right, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Um, so, um, there's a question that I, I, I have to begin with, really. Um, <clears throat> we, in, in our failure to sort of uh, see what the future might help, and you uh, admitted that you were sort of struggling a little bit to sort of figure out what might be coming, do you think it's just we're old? Um, yeah, I mean, I think... I think uh Right. Yes, I mean, that's what people said to me. A lot of people said that to me uh, about uh, retro retromania. Um, but um, I was uh, heartened by the fact that quite a lot of young people um, agreed with it as well. So I don't, you know, during the period of, of um, uh, bef you know, immediately before writing retromania, I was part of a sort of blog scene, and people of, you know people of all different ages were voicing some of the kind of complaints, you know, where's the innovation, where's the, where's the new subcultures, where's the new movements, um, and, uh, you know, why is there so much retro, you know, and the fact that you had these sort of, uh, th these graphic design people who were, like, fed up with, uh, you know, vintage aesthetics and wanted a new aesthetic, I think, indicates that there was, um, there was a kind of... Uh, Something going on that was kind of not going anywhere. But as I say, I think I think the certainly the idea of futurism and futuristicness, even if it's often quite cliched, that does seem to be more of a flavour now in the culture, generally. Um, you know, el el it, uh, electronic music has sort of kind of quietly crept back after that period in the two thousands when you know the guitar came back and and. Uh, a lot of young people wanted to be like the Strokes or something. Um, it seems, electronic music seems to have gradually crept back to be s sort of like what most people, most young people, as far as I can see, is is their primary li listening. Certainly in Europe, that's the sense I get, is that, um, uh, you know, there's there's rock bands and there's, you know, there's, there's still people playing electric guitar music, but, you know... Uh, it, it, what, what's weird about electronic music now is that it does, it, because it's so omnipresent, it doesn't signify the future anymore. You can't say it's the fu you know we're we're listening to future music because it's got a history that goes back to the late '80s, if not earlier, and it's everywhere. So it's now. So all it signifies is just contemporary music. I think electronic music. Yeah, I mean, you've identified the idea of these uh, uh, sort of reiterations of of what has gone before. That, that strikes me that. It, that it, that's obviously the sort of the, the ultimate breakdown, but it strikes me that actually what we really have is just a battle between the people who go through these moments where it's like the guitar is dead, yeah. and people go uh, electronic music, and then people get tired of electronic music and go back to the guitar. Yeah. Um, and at, at this point, we uh, we're just going through a period where there's a little bit more electronic music. I mean, the question to me is like, does music have to be electronic to be the future? Well, um, well, that's what I mentioned this word I came up with, futuroid, um, to get away with, to go, get away from sort of cliched ideas of the future as being electronic and cold or whatever. Um, and there, when I originally, I actually came up with that word on my blog a long time ago in a, in a sort of early um, debate with people, other bloggers, about some of these issues that would go on to inform Retromania. Uh, 
And the, the example I gave of, of something that was futuroid, but didn't conform to the idea of cliched futuristicness, was actually the guitar playing of the Edge in U2 in the, in the early 80s. It was a new sound. You know, he, had a, he came up with new sounds for the electric guitar. They didn't, you know, they were, they hadn't existed before he was doing them, really, I don't think. And, um, but you, you wouldn't describe U2 as futuristic, you know, because they weren't, you know, they weren't like craft work, they weren't like, you know, we are robots, or they weren't uh, dystopian, you know, but it was a new thing, you know. So I think there are a whole, as you're quite right, there's a whole bunch of innovations that don't necessarily correspond to um, to some sort of cultural lexicon of ideas and associations to do with the future, you know, which which now has this big history. You know, you know, it goes back to Jules Verne and to uh, Metropolis and and uh, art. You know, Art Deco had sort of ideas of the future and shiny metal things, and you know, so it's a, a sedimented history of the fifties had its sort of ideas of what the future would be like, where we'd have a pill for dinner, you know, and, and you'd have a robot dog. And, you know, there's, there's cliches upon cliches of the future that are all built up on top of each other. And it's almost like something you could just should just shove to one side because it's clearly not telling you anything more than what were the fantasies of different decades in the 20th century, really. I mean, one, one sort of movement, I hate using that word, but one movement that I sort of identified a few years back myself, which... In, in a weird way, felt both futuristic and also very retro maniac, was the sort of emerging, uh, they hate the phrase, but the emerging neoclassical uh, scene, the likes of Niels Fram and Olaf Arnolds, who took old instrumentation but tried to employ it in a new fashion. Yeah. Um, and and it, I'm, I'm almost getting the sense that the only way we can do this is to use old ideas and simply reinvent them. That the, yeah. the, 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 there is a finite amount of stuff that we can do with the instrumentation that we have. Yeah. Hence the idea that electronica might be the only route forward. Yeah, well, well, a, a lot of... Um, you know, there's, there, there's, a, there's an interest in... Um, you know, another thing is actually you can, you can discover instruments that failed in the marketplace, you know. Or, or didn't ever really take off that much, or had a brief moment, you know, in the past. Uh, there are all kinds of early synthesizers or strange keyboards that you know people could rediscover. As you say, you could do strange new. Th you could apply techniques to violins, or you know, maybe the harpsichord could somehow come back. Uh, actually, one avant-garde record that I have in my collection. Um, uh, that is spectacularly, it's not futuristic, but it's spectacularly unlistenable. Uh, and Avant Garde is a record by John Cage um, that uses sort of primitive computer techniques and a harpsichord, and it just makes this awful sound. You know, it's, it's no future that you'd want to be involved in. Or, but it actually, it, did, it, it was when they did a performance uh, of this piece in 1968, they used footage of NASA missions and stuff like that. So they felt that what they were doing to the harpsichord was um, was aligned with all the other things going on in the 60s to do with space and new... There was a lot of stuff in the 60s that was about art plus technology. It was That was a big concept in the art world at that time. And then, But then what happened in the 70s was you heard other things like performance art and body art and, and, and things that were very much not about technology. Or there was even a movement, I think, for sort of land-based art, you know, people making huge mounds of dirt with s circles around them, things that hardly anyone could ever see, you know. So uh, just in the 60s, people thought the future of art would be the integrating of art making and new technology. But what actually transpired next was a bunch of different things, you know. And I, I have to admit, a couple of years ago, I saw somebody making music out of a plant. Did but oh I didn't, really? didn't see a great future in there. <laughs> um, I mean, another thing I have to ask is, it's perhaps part of the problem that we have in identifying where things are going for. We've, we've just run out of names for genres. <laughs> I mean, you, you mentioned hipster electronica. Yeah. I kind of feel like if we're talking about hipster electronica, we, we, and I say this with all due respect, we're maybe scraping the barrel yeah. trying to... Well, that was more... Hipster electronica is more a social designation. It's a bit like the word indie. Um, it doesn't mean thing. It's a, it's a social or class designation. I... I 
passed a, I forget the name of it, I passed a poster in the street here for a, an, an indie festival that's coming up. And um, I was looking at the, the bands and there was, they were so varied, they, there was no way you could connect them. There was like, um, there was like a post-rock band, there was, um, I don't know, you know, there was a guy from the go-betweens, there was Dinosaur Junior. And it was all under the rubric, the, the rubric of indie. And I thought, well, indie clearly doesn't mean anything musically. It, and it doesn't really mean anything, because some indie bands are on major labels. So really, it just means a kind of class, a kind of class, a social demographic that likes that kind of music. The same demographic that reads Pitchfork or uh, probably, I don't, I'm not sure what the indie rock magazine in this country would be, but, you know, uh, that's all it's saying. So I think hipster electronic, I was more talking about the kind of person rather than actual style. Of I, I live in Berlin. I see an awful lot of hipster electronic. Yeah. <laughs> you, can rec you, can you can smell it pretty easily, you know, yeah. just... Um, uh, you also, I mean, this is referring a little bit more back to the Retromania book. You, you talked a little bit about, um, the di and also early on in your, your, uh, your talk, you talked a lot about uh, the dystopian future that, yeah. um, that you had envisaged when you were growing up and uh, yeah. how this hadn't sort of necessarily materialised. Personally, I feel almost that it has materialised, yeah. that, that, that we are seeing a lot of things that were particularly back there, more than negative well, things. The, one I, I, uh, the thing that I, I thought hadn't materialised was more like the trips to the moon and that mm. stuff. So that would be more utopian or at least positive, you know, or fun. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, they're, they're dystopian in the sense of... Um, there are a lot of dystopia. You, you know, you're quite right. The, su the surveillance—that's just the norm now. Uh, some of the things that you know that go on with computers and the internet uh, and how they track your purchases and all that—it does have that paranoid, uh, totalitarian idea. Where you know, it, and it does correspond. In fact, you know, it's not that we we don't live in a future where everyone has a is called a number instead of a name, but there is this thing of the idea that we're being watched and measured and monitored, uh, that was something that people thought the future would hold, you know, the, uh, surve surveillance, you know. So I think certain aspects of the dystopia, you know, drones, I mean, drones, it's pretty dystopian, really, isn't it? It's like, you know, it's pretty, that's, a, that's, a, um, that's fulfilling. I don't, th I don't know if anyone predicted that, but that's something that's pretty scary, you know. Yeah, I would agree. And we also have people flying two kilometres on a jetpack as of last week as well. Oh, so really? That's oh, quite right. exciting. So the jetpack could come back. <laughs> the jetpack is yeah. on its way back. Um, but I, did, I, I couldn't help but wonder whether part of the reason that we've retreated into older sounds as our inspiration is partially because we're slightly scared of the present that has materialised, that this, this sense of the dystopian future of the 60s yeah. and 70s that we'd seen now has materialised and we we need to retreat from this in some way and so we've been retreating in our music into these older sounds. Do you think there's any truth in that? I think that's one of the factors. I think one of the things, you know, as, w as well as Retromania being um, not a, a single underlying condition or a single etiology or, or, sim <laughs> or, or disease of the culture, it's actually a bunch of different things that I've lumped together. Uh, uh, there are also multiple causes and factors and motives that have converged as well. You know, um, fear of the future and wanting safety, and you know, it explains some of the things that go on. Like maybe there was a lot of interest in the early 2000s, especially in folk forms and things like that, and, and that still goes on to some extent. I think that's sort of going back to the human voice and uh, uh, and uh, you know, simple instruments, and that's could be analysed as a retreat from the present. Um, but there are other, you know, I mean, one of the factors is just that it's possible to, to access the past so much more easily and there's so much of it online that you can just uh, get lost in it, you know. Uh, you, you could get lost in old TV from your childhood. You can get lost in, uh, you can discover things that you, you know, that you would never have been able to, or you would have had to, look for much harder you know now it's up there you know so i think that's one of the factors the sort of the enabling technological matrix uh has encouraged people to sort of look to the past and do this kind of archaeological approach to making music i kind of wonder as well i mean you mentioned the fact that you see things now which which are more indicative of a future um yeah. 
I, I can't but wonder whether perhaps what we're seeing at the moment is, is the death throes of this sort of interest in, in the past that has been so uh, so keen over the last yeah. decade or so, and, and hence the fact that we're all getting so incredibly upset about the death of people that we didn't know, like David Bowie and Prince. Yeah. That this is the, this is kind of the beginning of the process at the end, and there is. The <laughs> That, that, that perhaps the uh, the announcement of Coachella's new festival, this uh, desert trip, as it's called, with Paul McCartney and the Who and Neil mm. Young and the Stones, this is just this is the final Rubicon we have to cross <laughs> before the baby boomers actually finally die and let the younger generation get on and make their own damn music at last. Well, it's uh, you know it's not that um, that these artists these uh, you know they call them legacy artists now that's a term that people use in the industry. Um, it's not like they prevented young people from making their own culture but they have sort of overshadowed um, their legends I suppose and the way those legends have been retold over and over again have overshadowed um, things and, and are sort of hard to um, push aside you know and a lot of people don't want to push them aside you know one of the things that I didn't write about in Retromania but I sort of noticed almost too late I don't know if it is happening in this country or uh, in Europe, but in certainly in the UK, it's a really big phenomenon, is the disappearance of the idea of the generation gap. And, you know, I know friends where the parents and the children go to the same gigs, they go, they go to the same rock festivals together, like groups of parents or, uh, and all their children, uh, sc you know, school friends, um, will go go to and camp at you know, these rock festivals. So, you know, the whole idea of, um, you know, there, there isn't that, I don't think that desire to reject the music of of your parents exists anymore because you've probably got quite cool parents, you know. My parents were into musicals and light jazz, which I love, but, you know, I, it was, I could be a fan of Public Image Limited and, and the Sex Pistols and that would be my music. But if your parents are into the Velvet Underground and, and uh, the Stones or the Cure and, Japan, or, you know, increasingly there are parents who were, like, into techno, you know, and stuff. So uh, why would you reject that, you know? If you've got cool parents and they've got a good record collection, you're more likely to want to um, yeah, embrace that. And, and, and uh, so I think that's something that's, you know, is a syndrome, that, 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 there, that antagonism between generations and the d defining of a generation against um, uh, parents or even older brothers and older sisters, that doesn't seem to be a dynamic anymore, where it really was once. You know, I just written a book about glam rock, and and part of the reason David Bowie and T Rex were so huge was that there was a whole demographic wanted to have bands that were different than what their older brother or older sister was into. You know, they didn't want the Stones; they wanted um, you know figures of their own. Uh, and, and that's like only two or three years age difference, but that was it was a um, uh, it was a, a, a dynamic that generated change within music culture, based on these uh, sort of micro generations, not even a full generation, but like the difference between uh, a, a twenty-one year old brother who's listening to Traffic and and Eric Clapton, and you know someone who's fourteen and, and wants Bowie or something, or wants their own thing, you know. Personally, I can't think of anything worse than going to shows with my family, but um, <laughs> yeah. I tried it once. It's really awful. Uh, another thing that has kind of disappeared, I think, which might be contributory to this, this situation that we found ourselves in, is, is um, not only has the generation gap, sort of the so-called generation gap, disappeared, but arguably the whole concept of people being loyal to genres has, has disappeared. Uh, there was a piece in The Guardian um, last summer or, or, or about a survey last summer, uh, which said that um, while millennials are passionate about music, 76% within the 13 to 17 year old bracket said they wouldn't be able to last a week without it, 79% of 13 to 32 year olds said their taste didn't fall into one specific music genre, and just 11% said that they only listened to one genre of music. Um, and, and Peter Robinson, the, uh, the, the journalist, ended up suggesting that millenni millennials are a genre-less generation. So I can't help but feel that if people aren't actually even focusing on one genre, one concept of, of the kind of music they like, that music can't blossom, it can't develop. And even if it does, we then have the Catch-22 uh, catch where it gets dissected so fast by this media mm. that we now live with 
that it's it's over before it yeah. even began to quote the Smiths. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and no, I think that that's true. I mean, that's something I n I no noticed um, uh, that young people seem to, well, they're able to listen to vastly more music than I would have been when I was growing up. I mean, I couldn't afford it, and you just. There, you know, there was. You might go to the local library and borrow some records. You might borrow records from your friends and tape them. But you know, the cassettes cost money, and, and too. So uh, you know, really, you were very limited to what you could access. And now, you know, obviously, for quite a while now, there's no limits to what people can access. And the, um, so I think it does create a different psychology where people have listened to a lot, lot more, but it hasn't generally affected them any given bit of what they listen to hasn't affected them in the way that you know when I got bought the album by the slits I think I only had two albums um, their first album cut so I, I played it like a hundred times I you know at, at least and I memorized every little vocal inflection and rhythm guitar tick and it sort of had this deep penetrative effect on on my memory and you know, it's like ingrained in my body almost. Um, and I think by definition, if you're listening to, you know, hundreds of records uh, a year, maybe thousands, that you can't have the same intense relationship with and you can't have that process of identity formation, which usually does involve either an iconic artist like a Bowie or a Morrissey, where they, they become like a phantom friend to you or a phantom lover or something like that. Uh, but also, or you could have the, for the identity formation process that is identification with the genre. Uh, you know, like uh, I'm into metal, I'm, or um, for me, even though I was quite old by the time it happened, I, you know, I was a junglist. I was into jungle music and hardcore rave music, and that, and it had this, you know, uh, not identity forming because I was 28 when this happened, but it changed my identity and changed my lifestyle in, in quite a profound way um, if, you, if you're listening to loads and loads of things and like one day of the week you go to a club another week you go to a rock gig then you see a folk thing it's a definitely it's a more diffuse relationship with music um, and it has its plus sides you know people seem to know so much more about music I, I, I noticed that w w often they seem to go through it almost methodically like they'll just like you know well, this week I'm going to go through, listen to every album by uh, the Rolling Stones, you know, all the way through, you know, um, uh, things that weren't even possible. You couldn't, you couldn't, it was almost impossible to do that, to like say, I'm going to do Joni Mitchell <coughs> and just listen to them. That, that it has a weird effect because um, the gaps in which you absorb music and digest it don't occur. And also, it flat, you know, historically it flattens it as well. You're kind of, you know, if you listen to... Uh, Joni Mitchell's first album, and then like six hours later, you're listening to the record she made in the mid '70s. You know, you're kind of squishing historical time. It's kind of, it's odd, I think. But it's you know, there are there are probably positives that come from listening very eclectically as well. I mean, I've it's sacrilegious to say, but as a sort of part-time music journalist myself, the fact that I get sent about a thousand records a year has taught me to value more than anything silence. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's my favourite record a lot of the time. Um, I had the privilege of reading a little bit of what you spoke about yeah. in advance, and there was something that you, you didn't get time to talk about, yeah. and I would like to just touch upon that briefly. I think we're also quite short of time, but um, you talked about uh, this idea that, the, that what might be coming mm. is a sense of a new Puritanism, as you called right. it, um, uh, a sort of large-scale reaction against decadence and selfless virtue. <laughs> um, and I just wondered if you wanted to elaborate on that idea a little bit, because I personally yeah. found it very interesting. Um, that sort of came out of um, working on this book about glam rock and thinking about how, um, if you look at the history of of rock music or, uh, or popular culture, there have been these phases when um, you know sort of glam phases, uh, like the early seventies, uh, the eight, you know, the eighties to some extent. I think currently we've been living in a long glam phase where there's a lot of a lot of pop music is about being famous. You know, it's it's you know people become famous through writing songs about being famous. Drake is the obvious example. His breakthrough record, he's already talking about the problems of fame. You know, and, and how fame is screwing up his life, and he's barely famous at this point. You know, so um, and you know David Bowie wrote fame in a song called Fame. You know, there's there's a you know 
glam rock was a, in large part a kind of uh, meta commentary on being a star. Uh, so, I got, so I got into this, but then there are these other phases that alternate where the values are much more underground, they're much more um, suspicious of showbiz and the idea of entertainment. So, you know, the earliest one was the 50s folk revival, which was very much against showbiz, against, you know, the word commercial was a very dirty word. It was very political, uh, anti-capitalist. The 60s uh, was another phase. Late 60s was very much like uh, back to nature. The ideas in it were very similar to Rousseau's ideas, of, you know, about purity and authenticity and stuff. And I think you can see grunge, obviously, in the night grunge in the 90s is obviously very anti-fame. You know, his conflicted feelings about fame were one of the reasons why it led to Kurt Cobain killing himself. You know, uh, so I think I think we just we we are overdue a sort of reaction against um, against mainstream pop music uh, and against the idea of glamour, against the idea of uh, of stardom as as a goal you know and and um who knows what that 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 reaction will take but i i suspect it will it's got to involve some kind of more communal ethos ethos some kind of idea that um it's not about people in the audience sort of looking up and worshiping someone but you're on the same level that sort of punk idea that the people on the stage and the people on the audience there's no difference uh, I think that's got to come back, and I think there's probably going to be some kind of um, feeling of <coughs> a reaction against de decadence. Uh, in the 70s, the, uh, the idea of decadence was glamorous. It was like you know people aspired to be decadent. D David Bowie and, uh, gave a press conference where he described himself and Lou Reed as like you know a sign that society was collapsing, <laughs> and <laughs> which is a very odd way of you know selling yourself to the press, you know. But he actually said, you know, oh yeah, if people like me and Lua are like, you know, becoming successful, that's that's showing society is collapsing and, you know, maybe fascism is around the corner, you know. And that was part of his whole thing. Um, I think that, I, so that's what I think is going to happen. And uh, I had various evidence that I, that I put up, but one of the things I, I felt that was a sign of new, a kind of new Puritanism, certainly in the English speaking world was is the success of of Bernie Sanders and Jerry Corbyn who are both very uncharismatic figures in the sense of they're not smooth <coughs> on television they you know they're old old men they don't dress well you know they're very different from the politicians we've had you know Obama uh, is very, was very good on television very smooth funny cool uh, there have been various other politicians like Tony Blair or David Cameron, a very slick, who worked in public relations. You know, you know. They, uh, so I felt that this sign that young people, certainly in the UK and Britain, were very idealistic, very looking for figures of authenticity, integrity, and even a kind of inflexibility in their ideas. The fact they'd stuck to their principles for decades, you know, never changing their opinions. Um, I thought actually maybe there's a taste for 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 a, a new kind of. Uh, uh, a pure, yeah, a kind of Puritan figure, or, or a, pu uh, a sort of politics of purity, uh, and uh, and you know, I, f I felt like maybe in the future, uh, people would look back and be mystified by the whole rock and roll era and think, what on earth, you know, what were they doing? You know, they were, while the world was, uh, you know, while the world, w you know, is being used up and destroyed, here's a culture that a lot of it is glamorizing excess. Glamorizing self-indulgence, glamorizing vanity, glam glamorizing you know all these uh, non-virtues. Perhaps people in the future will, will in 200 years' time, will look back and and the only people they'll think are heroic. Well, they won't be thinking of Prince or Bowie or people like that. They'll be thinking of I know Greenpeace activists or people like that. You know, people who who were actually trying to save the world. You know. Uh, so it was a kind of fantasy, I suppose. It was a speculative fantasy of the, of the obsolescence of pop culture as we've come to, to, to know it uh, as this sort of uh, very expensive, glamorous, um, fundamentally 
kind of decadent culture that it is. So, <laughs> I mean, my, my own fantasy, personally, is that we can perhaps return to having a little bit more mystery in the music and, the, the, and, and our musicians and our artists, and that, um, that perhaps were we to return to that stage where we know less, music might actually start becoming rather more exciting and far-sighted once again. Do you, do you think there's any truth <laughs> in that, or am I just no, I, dreaming? No, I, 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 I definitely recognise um, that appetite and that desire, yeah. There, there's too much information, I think, um, and you know how someone would recreate a sense of mystery, I don't know. I mean, maybe Radiohead trying to delete all the information about themselves is one tactic, or... Uh, you know, a, a group that didn't g go online at all, that only existed, had, was completely offline in some way. Uh, and, 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 and you could only experience them by going to their gigs, you know, uh, maybe. That would be another sort of mystery. Um, but yeah, definitely I feel like there's too much knowledge. And um, uh, I've actually noticed it affects writing about music like when i read when i read reviews now that or, or when i write things myself they, 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 you can't help it but just put loads and loads of data information and you kind of know what the artist is trying to do and i remember when you mentioned when uh, melody maker and in the late 80s i don't think i even read the press releases um we would use the records me and my colleagues at almost as blank pages to project our fantasies about the music onto. And there wasn't any way to look anything up. You wouldn't go on the internet. You might remember vaguely a piece with the butthole surfers that had been in another paper. Uh, you might remember a few facts, but really you, you didn't have... Um, nowadays artists kind of curate themselves and annotate themselves, you know. Uh, Beyonce is a good example of that, where, you know, every everything in her vi visual album is a cultural reference to something, and people have you know, people break down all the sources and allusions, and it's very, very crowded. Like that, you so it almost gets in the way of you having your own personal fantasy of the music. I think. Mm. Um, I was going to suggest that uh, we can put the uh, put the microphone out to the floor. I think we're a little bit late to be doing that. Um, if anybody has any very pressing questions, they want to let me know. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Want to go in the first row? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, the great uh, discourse and conference. And uh, I have a question about the uh, future. And uh, I want to apologize uh, for my ugly French accent. Uh, so, about the future interest in, uh, about the actual uh, interest in future, uh, when you see the um, the history of, of uh, cult culture, we can see art is always about escapism, and it's my opinion. And um, uh, don't you think that the retromaniac paradigm can be explained by the political and social situation of the post-war generation, and maybe the, the sleepy era we live, uh, who allowed us to celebrate the past? And now, in your very harsh present with terrorism, or war in the, our street in Europe, People want to escape and believe in the future again, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think I, th I think <coughs> in some ways um, the retro impulse and the futurist impulse they're quite related, and there are you know examples of um, uh, well, there are examples of musicians who, um, like in this book um, I wrote on post punk, there's a musician called um, Arto Lindsay who's making very avant garde strange music as DNA, in his main group DNA, but he's also in the lounge lizards, which is like a retro jazz thing, and they wear suits, you know. Y uh, so you can, like, have the, it can be a utopian impulse, I think, the retro thing. Like, for instance, people into rockabilly, and they, they dress like rockabilly, they listen to rockabilly. Their utopia is this sort of fantasy of America in 1950s and whatever, you know, and... and uh, Eddie Cochran and all that kind of stuff, um, and it, you know, it's 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 a, it's a more tangible um, utopia in a way because you've got things you can refer to, like you can say, oh, "It would have been so cool to drive this sort of car 
this particular car or, mo or motorbike and, and uh, dress this way, and you've got pictures to base it on. But it is a kind of utopian fantasy, um, just as much as imagining you know, the future with jetpacks or going to the moon or whatever. Um, so I think the impulses are similar. It's, yeah, it's all, often it's about le getting away from the present, you know. And in my own life, um, you know, I, um, uh, I've al always been very interested in history. But, uh, my first ambition was actually to be an archaeologist, and um, you know, which c you don't can't get more to do with the past than that. You know, I thought I imagined um, going to jungles and passing them, and there'd be a temple. You know, but of course, archaeology <laughs> involves digging through dirt and brushing dust off tiny bits of pot, uh, pots and things. You know, so I realised it wasn't as, as glamorous as that. But yeah, you know, I, I, I'm uh, the Retromania is not um, the, the book Retromania is not like uh, I'm not pointing a finger at other people. I'm pointing a finger at myself because I'm obsessed with the past. I, I, um, you know, I spend a lot of time watching television from the 1970s, you know, on YouTube uh, and listening, you know, digging up old records. So I think that the impulse, uh, you know, there's a common impulse of being dissatisfied with the now that can fuel both the retro impulse uh, and the more futuristic uh, science fiction kind of politics or music activity. Uh, there was another question in yeah, the I think button. You thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you. It was really interesting, and um, it's a funny coincidence that I'm wearing a Doors shirt. <laughs> um, I was wondering. Um, I have the impression that people from my generation um, have the feeling that everything has been done before. Yeah. So I'd like to know if that's a feeling that every generation has had, or if it's just us and we actually have done everything that was possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose what history show history does repeatedly show. Um, and I think it applies to uh, probably all the arts uh, and literature and stuff. Th there are phases where people feel like it's all been done and what to do, uh, you know, and there's a sense of exhaustion. Uh, I'm sure there have been periods in the history of literature where people have felt like there's nothing more that can be done with language or with, the n with, with narrative or the representation of character or whatever. And and then someone does come up with something. So, um, and the fact of the, that feeling of it's all been done is an interesting phenomenon in itself. You know, it's something to um, uh, to historicize. You know, what causes it? Um, I mean, w when I first started writing in the late '80s, I actually felt a lot like that, and and um, wrote about bands who were were using music from the late 60s as their basis and I some of them were doing it in a very exact sort of way like Primal Scream was a group that was very much you know specifically referring to things and then there were others I felt were more like using 60s ideas as a as a launching pad to do new things like My Bloody Valentine had a reference to the birds and groups like that but that I think they, they started making sounds that you hadn't heard before so, um, but yeah, I remember feeling very much like kind of worried, you know, like was there ever going to be anything new again? And um, uh, even in the late 80s, there was that sort of feeling uh, that there was a lot of history. History had built up, that it had gathered and accumulated behind us. And it was increasingly tempting for bands in, in you know, in alternative rock, uh, it was increasingly tempting for them to re reference the 60s. And there were so many things happening in the 60s. You could have a whole group of groups just based around sort of the birds, another group, a bunch of groups based around, you know, acid rock. And, you know, um, but the door, yeah, the door, I love the doors. And, you know, there's a couple of uh, lines that are applicable. One, of th one is the line about um, learn to forget is one of the great Jim Morrison lines. And there's another one where he says something like, it's more to do with um, desire and, and guilt, I suppose. But uh, it's a similar sort of idea, which is something like, uh, no eternal reward will forgive us now for wasting the dawn, which I just think is uh, a great sort of sentiment and like um, 
uh, a spur to remind yourself to um, you know, seize the time, uh, which is quite hard to do sometimes. <laughs> is there any other questions, or should we seize the bar? <laughs> seize the bar. <laughs> Carpe bar. Yeah. Okay, well, in that case, um, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank Simon very much for giving up his time and flying all the way over from LA to speak to us today about the future. So, uh, and thank, thanks, Wyndham, for great, great questions. And <laughs> thank you very much, Dee. So, thanks, everybody. <laughs> Cheers.